Well, hello, ladies, and welcome to Flavor Sisterhood installment. <laughs> Good, installment number two of I Heart Me. And um, last time we had a great session where we visited about what it means to love ourselves and is that truly a biblical principle. And we found that God has a lot to say about it, although he doesn't just put it in black and white print. Yes, Lisa is to love Lisa or Tien is to love Tien, or Chris is to love Chris. There's nowhere in the Bible that it just says it in black and white, but he clearly points us in that direction by several scriptures that we talked about last time. And so I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoyed the devotionals of this past week. I certainly did. Um, I just want to recap just for a second, um, because last time we talked about it's all about me. And I gave you four points about it's all about me understanding these four things. The first thing was it's all about me understanding I am the object of God's perfect love. The second one is that I need to understand it's all about me understanding I can love me and others because God first loved me. He's the author of love and he first loved me. The third one is that I have to understand that it is God's love for me that makes me able to love others. I should love whatever or whomever God loves. Yikes, that's a little hard sometimes. Number four, and this one is the most important for all of us to grasp. So if you missed last week, I want you to hear me right now. Number four, when I peel away the filters and remove the edits... I can see myself for who I really am, who I really am. And when I look at myself, minus the filters and the edits, I see somebody who's unworthy. But this is the statement, the power statement. Maybe this is the tweetable statement. We are unworthy of his perfect love, and yet his perfect love makes us worthy. Is that not paradoxical? Isn't that somewhat contradictory? And yet, that's the beauty of what God's love does for me. It transforms. So when I understand God's love and apply it and receive it into my life, something transformational takes place. I am no longer that unworthy individual. I'm no longer that person who's fragmented and uh, fallen. Yes, I'm still going to make mistakes. Yes, I'm still going to struggle. Yes, I'm going to have difficulties. But in every piece of me that was lacking, God's love fills in the gaps. I, I mean, that's a miracle. So often we say, oh, a miracle is the lame being healed or the blind being able to see. Or, and those are miracles. But don't discount the miracle of what God has done in your life and what God has done in my life, when he has taken that which was broken and made it whole, and he takes that which is broken and uses it in a purposeful and powerful way. I mean, that is a miracle. Now, that's something we should clap about, I'm thinking. Because that means all of us, all of us are miracles. Those of us who have applied the love of God in our lives. So it's all about me understanding those things, but quickly it needs to transition to, and here's our statement for this week, it's all about thee. Let's say that together. It's all about thee. Okay. So I doubt that any of us would debate that we need to be looking to God for our props. We need to be looking to God for our understanding of the world, our understanding of ourselves, our understanding of scripture, we should look at the Bible and say, okay, what does it have to say about how I should live my life today? All of us would pretty much agree about that. We understand that it's all about me receiving the love of God, and then it's all about me turning and transitioning that to thee. Easy to say, hard to live out. Totally difficult to live out. Because in this room and in all of our different environments as we gather for flavor today, if we as a flavor sisterhood really knew how to live it out, what would it look like to everybody we come in contact with? Because it's that love that God's given us that allows us to love others. 
If I have a difficult time understanding how much God loves me, then I'm going to have a really tough time loving others. And God loves others, so if they're the object of his love, they should be the object of my love. So see, the application process for how we live out our lives successfully is very much hinging upon our understanding of God's love for us. So that transition needs to take place from it's all about me to it's all about thee. We're going to look at what God has to say about not just understanding these principles, but living them out successfully. Now, I dare say that most every woman hearing my voice has struggled at some point with loving yourself. I have. I'm just going to admit it. I have struggled with certain things that I don't like about myself. I've struggled with certain things about how I grew up, where I grew up, the family that I was born into. I've struggled with um, different things maybe that were said to me. And I think maybe right now in your mind, some things are popping up in your psyche telling you, oh, remember what was said? Remember how you felt? Remember the reflection that you, or the image that you downloaded of yourself? Maybe inaccurate, accurate, whatever. We all have trouble and struggle at times loving ourselves. A study that was done by Dove, you know, the soap, Dove Soap, um, they have a research institute, and they did a, uh, do a lot of research on women because we are their primary um, marketing targets, I guess you should say. These are some statistics, so just I'm going to read through them and you just listen to them. Only 4% of women around the world consider themselves beautiful. That's up from 2% in 2004. Only 11% of girls globally, that means worldwide, are comfortable using the word beautiful to describe themselves. 72% of girls feel tremendous pressure to be beautiful. 80% of women agree that every woman has something about her that is beautiful, but do not see their own beauty. More than half, about 54% of women globally, agree that when it comes to how they look, they are their own worst beauty critic. There was also something I watched on, um, I I think it was YouTube, and it was an artist who was behind a curtain, and these women came in and they did a description of another woman, and then they did a description of themselves, and the artist painted or sketched those, and invariably, the sketch of the woman um, that was being described was beautiful. The sketch of the woman who was describing herself was not beautiful, and the artist could not see either one, so he was basing his sketches off the verbal communication of the woman doing the describing. Does that make sense? Okay. So obviously we have a a situation here. We, We have a crisis among us. Because on the one hand, we understand fully, oh my gosh, God created me. He loves me. He lavished his love upon me. And yet, oh my gosh, I don't love me. How contradictory is that? We understand it, but living it out is sometimes next to impossible, based on what happens in our mind, what happens when we look at other people, compare ourselves, all of these different things. And God doesn't want us to live that way. We're living in bondage, basically, from our own mental perception. So those statistics talked about beauty from a physical standpoint, but... Many of us have trouble seeing the physical beauty because we are so spiritually messed up. A couple weeks ago, Landon Pickering did a message um, in the weekend services. Amazing. If you weren't here, watch it. You can go to fellowshipchurch.com and watch the archives. Amazing about image and how we focus on those things what we see in a mirror And yet, so often, we just toss aside those things that are not physical. 
It's time for us to say, you know what, I understand my perception and my challenge and all about this physical stuff, but what does the Bible say about the behind the scenes stuff? The stuff that people don't necessarily see, but when they get to know me, they're going to experience. In fact, let me just share a little bit. I want to give you a story before I give you some supporting scriptures for my thoughts. There's a story in Matthew 14 where Jesus has just learned of the beheading of John the Baptist. Now, I would imagine this is Jesus' cousin. John the Baptist is the one who prepared the way for the Lord. Jesus had great respect and admiration for John because John was the picture of humility. He He wasn't threatened by the Messiah He wasn't jealous of the Messiah. In fact, he did everything possible to push Jesus forward and to step back so that people would know where their true salvation would come from. Jesus has just learned that John the Baptist has been beheaded. And it disturbs him greatly. In fact, he draws away up into the hillside. But then people hear that he's in the hillside, so they come and they want to... uh, Listen to him teach. They've heard of his miracles. And can't you imagine how drained he is at this point physically? And yet, and I I guess too, we get a little bit, um, I don't know, we get confused because yes, Jesus was God, but he also stepped down from heaven to become fully man. So heart and emotion and all of that, yeah, I mean, Jesus was God, But this was painful. This was hurt. This was him experiencing loss. That's that savior that we talk about that identifies with every single thing we go through. Everything. Okay, so we say that, but everything. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what you've experienced this week. I don't know what is happening in your life, but God does. And Jesus felt every bit of the pain. There's nothing that he didn't feel. So Jesus is coming off of that, and then he and, and, and that's where the feeding of the 5,000 takes place. So that's just a little bit of a miracle that he did right then and there amongst all the difficulty that he was experiencing behind the scenes, but able to continue in his faith because God was present with him. Okay? Fully God, fully man. So after the feeding of the 5,000 and the disciples are like, okay, Jesus, go ahead and say it. You told us so. I mean, you turned, you told us not to turn the people away, and we didn't turn the people away, and you told us that you'd provide the food, and you said a blessing, and bam, there was fish and bread for everybody. And the disciples are pretty much like, okay, well, he's done it again. He's done what he's told us he would do again. And then Jesus says, listen, guys, I need some time to myself. I want you to go across the Sea of Galilee, get in the boat, and just head on out, and I'll join you later. And so he draws away once again. And then night comes, and this is the, what happens in Matthew 14, 28 through 33. So they're in the boat, the winds have kicked up, and Jesus decides, well, I, I need to go meet the disciples. So he doesn't swim, he walks on the water out to the disciples. And when he gets just a little bit away, they see him and they go, oh, it's a ghost. How quickly they forgot that they had just been with Jesus and he had just done these miracles. And oh my gosh, if he could feed 5,000 with a couple of little fish and bread, then I guess he could walk on water. But of course not. The most rational thing to do is go, oh my gosh, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. And so this is the exchange. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat. I I applaud Peter. He got out of the boat. He believed. He he understood. This is Jesus. And if he wants me to walk on water, I will walk on water. And he gets out of the boat. I applaud him for that. He got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But verse 30. But. Oh, it's a big but. (laughs) But seeing the wind. Have you seen the wind? I thought the wind was unseen. 
No, but you experience the wind. You feel the wind. You're swept away with the wind, but you don't often see the wind. You see the power of it, but you don't necessarily physically see it. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began, and, be, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately. I love that word. Say that word. Immediately. Again, immediately in all of our different environments. Immediately. Jesus reached out his hand. Without hesitation, Jesus reached out his hand, took hold of him, and said to him, <laughs> he calls him out, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? But when they got back into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly the Son of God. Okay. So, Peter had faith enough to understand that if he got out of the boat, Jesus was perfectly capable of helping him walk to the, on, on water to him. But he got distracted. He got distracted. He took his eyes off Jesus. Okay, so you and I totally understand. God loves us. God invented love. He lavished his love upon, to, upon us. You know, we should love ourselves because he, we are the object of his love. And, and he's given us this love to love other people. And we understand all that, but we get distracted. The wind comes. The wind may be the voice of a parent that was abusive. The wind may be that reminder that you have a physical ailment of some sort. The wind may be something that, you know, it, and you can't really see it, but yet you've experienced, you feel it, it's emotional. The wind has come. And you're totally distracted, and guess what happens next? You just start to sink. You sink. But the good news is you just have to call out. I'm sinking, I'm sinking, I'm sinking. Jesus! See, the Bible compares us to sheep. You know, sheep are ugly, dumb, stupid. I mean, yes, in, in Easter baskets and everything, they're really cute little fluffy <laughs> stuffed animals. But bottom line is, if you go to the petting zoo and you go pet the sheep, get your hand wipes ready. They stink. And they smell. And if they weren't in that corral, they would wander and wander and wander and wander. And even though they've heard the voice of the shepherd all these different times, and even though they know that the shepherd is the one that feeds them, and even though they know that the shepherd is the one that cares for them, and even though that they know the shepherd has their best interest at heart, they still forget. They forget. And they get distracted. Oh, there's a blade of grass over there. And I think if I go over here and they, and they are taken away maybe by the wind. You are loved. I am loved. And that love flows into us and through us. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians. I'm going to skip over just for a second. It says, if I can find it, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. I was going to wait and use this in a minute, but it says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphant, per, triumphal procession in Christ. Say that, in Christ. In Christ, everywhere. In Christ. Not in me, in Christ. And through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. Say, through us. Yes. Say, through me. Through me. He's going to use you and me to spread his glorious fragrance to the world. Okay, so if we don't get it, if we don't fully understand his love and live it out, we're going to miss out on the most purposeful life on the planet. Okay? So, in fact, next week's talk, I'm pretty sure, is going to be entitled, Don't Buy the Lie, about how we have to stay focused on what God says about us. Not what the world says, what God says about us. Okay, I'm getting excited. Okay, <laughs> so don't take your eyes off Jesus. In the New Testament, Paul wrote to the Galatians, the Ephesians, the Corinthians, the Philippians, and lots of more people. The people of Colossae, I think I got them all right. But 
Basically, all of those letters Paul wrote because they were having some issues in the churches in those communities. They were forgetting that, oh dear, it's not about the law, it's about the grace of Christ. They forgot that, you know what, the circumcision, that's by the law, but Jesus came and it's now about the cross. And then there were some, like the Corinthians, they got all messed up in this worldly stuff and they had people coming in and teaching them and going, well, yes, it is about Christ, but you have these three or four teachers that have really impacted you. So is it about Jesus or is it about, you know, these teachers? And so all of a sudden, all of these different books were written by Paul to say, whoa, 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 remember, keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, I'm, of course, paraphrasing. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving it the, the brief Wikipedia version. <laughs> Keep your eyes on Jesus. It is as simple as that, but yet as complex as that, because guess what? The winds are blowing. The winds are moving. And the devil uses those winds to get our eyes off of Jesus, and all of a sudden we're sinking, and the worst thing in the world that we can ever do is to not call out to Jesus. Jesus responds to Peter and he says, oh, you of little faith. Well, he had the faith to get out of the boat, but Jesus calls him out. And you know what? Sometimes we need to be called out. I need to be called out. I need to say, okay, God, you're right. I, I mean, I, this, this little episode in my life demonstrated poor faith. I took my eyes off of you. In 2000, there was a study by Thomas Joyner, um, a psychologist, professor of psychology at Florida State University. Okay. <laughs> About them Knowles, national champions. Okay, let's get back on topic. Uh, and his partner, uh, Roy Ballmeister. Now, they did a study, and it's really funny because I'm sure it took a huge amount of money to secure the grant for them to do the study. And these are the basic results of the study. We remember negative things way more than we remember positive things. I should have blamed that on Ohio State or some other university, not Florida State. All good. I mean, it's good. It's documented. We now know. We believe negative things better, more than we do positive things. Seriously. I love to cook, but if I'm making breakfast, you know what phrase comes out of my husband's mouth? And it's a total joke, so don't send hate mail to Ed. He goes, are we having eggs over Lisa? And that, you know why? Because one time I made eggs and it was a disaster. They all stuck to the pan. I evidently didn't put enough grease in there, whatever, you know, pan, butter, anything. They all stuck. Every yolk broke. Oh, that's not a rap song. Every yolk broke. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and from that moment on, it became eggs over Lisa. And the kids, you know, they were growing up and then say, Daddy, what's eggs over Lisa? And then we get a good explanation. And Ed will be the first to tell you about all the fabulous meals I have cooked. I'll even Instagram some of them. Hello. But there's nothing like eggs over Lisa. And you know what? If I was not secure in myself, I might cry every time I made breakfast or I might never make breakfast again because of the, the fear of eggs over Lisa. It's just a joke. Haven't you ever heard of a joke? <laughs> but we remember the negative, and it's like a megaphone in our heads, in our psyche. So what are we going to, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do? The truth of the matter is that all of us are going to experience negativity in our lives. But we're either going to keep our eyes on Jesus or the wind, or the wind. No human being, whether it's a coach, a teacher, a parent, a pastor, a, a neighbor, whatever, a coworker, a boss, no human being has power over you. They have not lavished their love upon you, only God, through Christ. That's right. No human being has the power to control your thoughts. Jesus is the only one who can control your life. He's the only one who can control your life. Jesus is the only one who can control your life. You can't say that enough. 
Keep your eyes on Jesus. It's all about thee. But the problem is, is when I stay in the it's all about me. See, it is all about me understanding those things about God's love, but if I stay at it's all about me, I become consumed with me. And me becomes the wind. Me can become my own worst enemy. Me can become someone who steals the joy. Because me represents all those things that are going on in my head. God has a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us. And we can't get in the way of that. We've got to celebrate what he wants to do in our lives. Keep your eyes on Jesus. There's a word I want to give you. It's, it's a word that's common, but again, hard to practice. It's contentment. Contentment. How do you define contentment? Contentment is having peace with God and therefore being at peace with your situation or yourself. Contentment. Having peace with God so that you can have peace with yourself. Does that mean if I'm content that I don't need any improvement? No, it does not. <laughs> Why did Jesus give us the Holy Spirit? Ooh, the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? For some, that may be a new term for you. But basically, when Jesus was going to heaven, when he was ascending to heaven, he told the disciples, he goes, I'm going to send a comforter to you so that you're not alone. It's an unseen person, but it's, it's the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of Jesus. And he's our comforter. He's our counselor. And there's verses that I'm not going to have time to go into, but that tell about this before Jesus ascended to heaven. He goes, look, you're not alone. You're going to be equipped through the Holy Spirit. You and I are equipped through the Holy Spirit. When we receive Jesus Christ, Jesus is not physically here on earth with us. He's in heaven with the Father. But the Spirit is deposited into our hearts. We become, oh my goodness, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our physical bodies, dear me, does that mean that wow, I've got to have my makeup just right. I've got to have my hair just right. I've got to have all these things in place for the Holy Spirit to find his home welcoming in me. No, it means my heart's got to be right. Oh dear, if we would only spend as much time making the Holy Spirit comfortable through our heart than worrying about our outward appearance. In fact, this is what it says about our outward appearance. You know what? Let's think about it. What should we be focused on? What's really important? Well, before we talk about what's important, let's talk about what's not important. 1 Peter 3, 4 says, 3, 3 through 4 says, and this is the Message Bible, what matters is not your outer appearance, the styling of your hair, the jewelry you wear, the cut of your clothes. What is important? The last part of the verse, but your inner disposition. Cultivate inner beauty the gentle, gracious kind that God delights in. That's what's important. Pretty simple, isn't it? Doesn't mean that we're anti-makeup, anti-hair. I love it. I do. I enjoy it. But if that's the thing, we're mistaken. We're mistaken. It's about what makes God delight in our heart. It's our inner disposition. Back to contentment. What's the secret? Three things. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Look at Peter. Keep your eyes on Jesus. The wind blows, it's going to blow. There's going to be storms, there's going to be tough times, there's going to be distractions. We're like sheep, come on. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Number two, have a thankful heart. I already read you the verse from 2 Corinthians 2.14, but thanks be to God who leads us in triumphal uh, procession in Christ. In Christ, thanks be to God. Do you know how hard it is to be angry when you're thankful? There's more happy people on Thanksgiving when they're overlooking a lot of relatives. More happy, pe <laughs> more happy people on Thanksgiving because you sit and think, this is what I'm thankful for. And all of a sudden, your view goes from not what is lacking, but to what is present. Okay? So have a thankful heart. Thanks be to God for using you. Thanks be to God for using me. And then the third thing is to praise him for his works. 
man, download this verse, write it on your mirror and soap, whatever. I do that sometimes. I write on my mirror. I write messages to my husband. I write messages to myself. Psalm 139. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I know it, and I'm going to live it out. The last part was me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and therefore I praise you, God, because you don't make junk. We've heard that. He doesn't. Not only does he not make junk, he doesn't make anyone who is not purpose-driven. He has made us to accomplish things on this planet, to love other people, to show other people the love of God, to do his work. But yet so often we are just so distracted, we forget. Back to the boat. Do you know what Peter and the disciples did? Jesus got in and he kind of gave them the 411, O ye of little faith. But then they started praising him. They started thanking him. And they worshiped him. The Savior was in the boat. The Savior is in our boat. It's, he's in our boat. We have so much potential in this room and beyond. But potential means we haven't done it yet. What is happening, what's going on in your life and mine that's keeping us, that's distracting us, that's blowing through our life, that's keeping us from saying, God, you are God. You've lavished your love on me, and I thank you for that, and I praise you for that, and I will not take my eyes off of you. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you that I and every person hearing my voice are the object of your love. Father, forgive us. Forgive me when I get distracted and I look elsewhere for my props. I look elsewhere for my self-esteem. I look elsewhere for my self-image. I look elsewhere for my purpose. Forgive me when I take my eyes off you. I want to be a difference maker in this world. And I know, Father, that I can only do that when I receive the love that you have for me and I live it out. I don't want to just understand this. I want to live it out. Father, if there's anybody in this room or all the different rooms around the Metroplex, Miami, South Carolina, that has not totally surrendered their life to you and received that love, that forgiveness, I pray that tonight's the night. Just say, God, I give myself to you. I receive the love and forgiveness that you did, gave me on the cross. I want to be different, and I want to live in that love and have purpose and meaning. Just say that prayer. It's a prayer I said many, many years ago. I, I was nine years old, kneeling by a coffee table. You can do it right now in your seat at Flavor Sisterhood. Others, Father, I'm just going to put it out there. There are some people here that are messed up and distracted by the mirror that they're looking in. They're looking at all the wrong things, focusing on all the wrong things. And I pray right now, Father, that you would forgive us all for that. And you would lead us to see ourselves as how you see us, worthy because of your love. Purposeful because of your love. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.